welcome everyone to our very first uh, virtual Agile Meetup. And this group is well for everybody, consultants, developers, entrepreneurs, you name it. And um, the first thing, hold on a second, I think I need to add who's joining. There we go. And yeah, so the first thing that I wanted to, to say is a big thank you. Uh, for being here and for the time that you're investing with us and to learn from each other. That's basically, you know, the, the thing of going into a agile, agile journey is like a maze. We all start maybe in the, the first beginning, but then we all hit different obstacles and challenges and frustrations on where we want to go. And so there is just so much stuff out there and there is not enough time to learn everything by ourselves. So we learn along the way and with each other, hence the reason of this group. And well, who am I? I'm Ines Garcia. I'm an Agile coach and a Salesforce MVP. And together, what this means that I do every day is help organizations to become more Agile while deliver Salesforce technology and CRM. And so just to say that today, we're going to be learning from two different journeys, from that move from project management to to agile practitioners of our guest. And this transition is really hard. And again, we'll be recording the session and so that is accessible content in the future for everybody. And we will post a message once the recording is ready. And our time box for this meetup is one and a half hours all in all. So just now, I will love for you in the next 15 seconds to hit the chat and answer something. Which kind of burning questions do you have? What are you keen to learn today from our speakers? And just to say that if you are wondering, then most likely others are going to be wondering as well. So just pop it in the chat from the agenda today, which are your questions? Last thing is that after every session uh, will be a few minutes so we can do some Q&A so you can get your sessions, uh, your questions ready or you can also pop them into the chat, uh, however you prefer. And so without further ado, Helen, I will stop sharing. The floor is yours. Excellent. Thank you, Ines. So let me just try my first challenge of the evening and see if I can share my screen. Uh, with me. Right, guys, can you see, uh, can you see my screen? <laughs> the usual quiet response that you get on a meeting. Okay, so my name's Helen. I'm an agile geek and a recovering project manager. I've delivered as a project manager for consultancies and clients. I've been and done and seen a lot of things um, from what feels like a very short-lived 12, well, over 12 years of my career. And it's only really in the past few years that I've started to realize the importance of what really drives people. So now I'm my own boss. Um, I set up Make It four years ago, and it's here where I started to deliver projects primarily focusing on iterative and incremental delivery. So my aim is to bring value sooner and with a smile this time to my clients. Um, alongside this, I coach management team and team, sorry, on how not to get fired. Um, I also run agile training workshops and a few other things as a scrum master. So all of this together kind of built this talk that hopefully uh, you guys will enjoy today. So as a scrum masters and product owners and devs teams, we're all working together to bring value to our customers. But the story that I want to tell today 
or tonight I should say, um, is my mindset change from a command and control to servant leadership as a scrum master. So let's get cranking. Right, so when I, when I started to make that mindset transition from this command and control lead, and from this I mean like the project manager directing the what's, the why's, the how's, the team will do something. I was continuously um, challenged with contradiction, confusion, and an imbalance of thoughts and ideas of how to actually properly serve the team, but yet not be the boss of the team. Um, and always deal with that continuous pressure um, of demanding management of why timelines perhaps weren't in some kind of Gantt form or what was happening with rebaselining, um, why estimates were done through playing poker and how on earth teams were going to be able to bring value sooner to customers. All of this was a bit of a gray area. But over the years, um, I have narrowed down this to four areas of how to move from a command and control, bossy boss of teams, to enabling teams to self-organize, be cross-functional, and to be driven and excited about doing projects. So for those who are new to Agile, um, self-organizing teams are teams that are autonomous over how they deliver their work and what it is um, they bring into uh, the time box that they're delivering in, and that derives from the ordered, um, it's ordered now, not prioritized backlog um, that the product owner puts together. And a cross-functional team are a team that basically has all the skill sets needed to complete that time box. And they work together in order to complete that time box by picking up uh, what's needed, um, within their sort of Kanban, uh, Kanban uh, visual, visual representation of work. Um, so that looks like, you know, anybody can pick up testing of the features, anybody can bring up uh, the building of the features or anything else really. So there's no fixed roles per se. So these four key areas that I've, uh, that I've picked out and I'll talk about in a moment are there to bring better value, sooner, safer, and happier. So whether you have been, or you have witnessed, or you've just become really frustrated with traditional project management, then I ask you now to activate your listening ears. And I'm hoping we have some Judge Judy fans in the talk today, in the, in the night today. So firstly then, optimism over delivery. My second is optimism over communication. Third, optimism over constraints. What happens if Jim goes on holiday, some of those resource constraints. Optimism over planning. And you may have heard this quote, as Mike Tyson says, everyone has a plan until you get punched in the face. And I'm sure, um, <laughs> sure there's some people that have felt like that in the past, especially as project managers. So let's start then with uh, optimism over delivery. So as a project manager, you're often, as, uh, often under a lot of pressure from every angle. I especially um, got given projects that were already half-baked, um, so optimistically, uh, there was a plan that was already given that was promising the world. But instead of that, they were ending up heading towards delivering an underdeveloped, crater-filled, cold moon. Over-promising and under-delivering as a project manager is really the worst. One question that, that I always ask um, whether I am scrumming it or as a previous project manager when going into a project with fresh eyes is, asking the team, guys, is this plan that we've put together really realistic? And often I would get an answer of no, but this is what we promised. Well, you know what? I'm really sorry to break this to you guys, but promises actually aren't magical. 
Um, they don't perform any tricks or anything like that. Um, so what I've learned along the way is to, um, to accept that actually perhaps that isn't going to work to plan. And it's okay to accept that. Perhaps you did overpromise something, and perhaps there is a likelihood, whether that's strong or weak, of under-delivering something. But it's really important to recognize and address that actually, as a team, what value can we actually deliver today? Or perhaps what value can we deliver next week? Start with a blank canvas like this, map it out, have a look at what value you can bring. Then be open and transparent. Don't wait for your customers or your boss or your product owner, you know, whoever it might be, um, speak up then, challenge the status quo and present the value um, that the team can actually bring sooner and by far much happier um, to your customers. And I always uh, remember now uh, that core value of Agile being responding to change over following a plan. Because projects, however optimistic we are about them, um, they don't go to plan because we don't have a glass ball um, that tells us the unknowns. So secondly then, moving on to optimism over communication. So perhaps as a project manager, you truly believe that you will be able to achieve that goal and the team will work day and night to do it. And maybe they will, but this just isn't healthy. Optimism is really great, but driving people down a continuous dark alley of working 24 hours is not great. So as a PM, um, much of the time, uh, you experience a lot of pressure to submit plans based on your thoughts, your ideas, your experience. But there's always that niggle, that tiny um, or potentially very large niggle that it may not work out or um, that there's a chance that something could actually derail the plan because of that sort of no, no contingency or massive contingency that actually gets eaten up quite quickly. So the important thing is to communicate. And communication is key here. We all know that, but how often do we actually do it in time? It's not just about communicating and what we communicate, it's about the time that we take to communicate as well. And as Agile teams and an, an, an Agile professional now, I've learned that transparency and openness are the pillars of, that keep us standing. So before you're, you're late or before you get the question of, are you confident that we'll be able to complete this? Or certainly before that meeting that you've already arranged, make sure that you communicate and communicate effectively. The number of times that, uh, that I was in meetings and even still now, and I find it incredibly frustrating um, at times that you're sitting there and you hear the team say, you know what, we delivered A, B, C, um, isn't it really great? And then, you know, one, one person will ask, uh, or the receiver of that information will ask, well, what about D? And the team are like, oh, dear, like, uh, well, we've, received, we've, we've delivered A, B, and C. But unfortunately, certainly from my experience and my journey that I've taken, is that the receiver of those achievements, yeah, they're pleased about that. But what's actually heard is more the delay to that activity, so that later activity. Because last time, you may not have said there was an issue. Um, so yeah. So keep communication regular. And also keep it memorable. You'll be told if you communicate too much. But you are less likely to be told when you're not communicating enough. Instead, the receiver of that communication or lack of communication may just turn and talk about it with everybody else but you as a scrum team. So keep your communication regular and keep it memorable. What's memorable communication? Well, as project management teams, they love, project management teams love to, uh, to have status reports. 
But communication shouldn't be in the form of a status report. That is a massive uh, misunderstanding, I think, among projects. Um, they aren't read properly, or if they're read at all, it's just a tick in the box. Um, people and management teams and you know anybody else who's looking for red, and if there's no red, it's kind of ignored. Project directors, um, and this is not all project directors, so any in the room or any listening to this, um, often don't like to put a red mark down on there as a rag because it looks bad. Um, so you're dealing with avoidance then, you're dealing with the element of surprise when something goes from green to red in a matter of hours after months and months of potentially inaccurate reporting. So what can you do instead? Well, remembering as agile teams that we want to show value and we want to show value early and often. So use these communication tools, show and tell. If you're not familiar with a show and tell, um, this is about the development team showing what you've done and also showing what you haven't done. That's also very important. Getting feedback from the customers and getting feedback can be scary when you're, when you, when you're showing things that perhaps you haven't done. But as agile teams, continuous feedback is vital for continuous improvement. Perhaps even try walking over to someone's desk if you're back in the office safely, or even picking up the phone if you're remote, or you've got other forms of communication. But I would highly recommend um, show and tell. It's really important. So don't fear talking to people when making that transaction between project management, or if you're used to doing these cyclic or daily or weekly reports. Um, as teams and as agile teams, we value reg regular feedback. Those interactions, um, individuals, sorry, and interactions over processes and tools. Let's keep those values um, at the core of delivering projects. Next up then, optimism over constraints. Here I'm particularly focusing on uh, resource constraints, so optimism over resource constraints. The number of times as a project manager, I have heard we weren't able to do this because we had resource constraints. Well, if I was paid a pound every time that I heard that, uh, I wouldn't be here right now. But what I did gain instead was actually very frustrated uh, customers and clients. So my message here is to be real. In traditional linear processes, when one person is out of office, it can really stop the flow, like a huge bottleneck. And Agile looks at resource constraints in the face and treats it as a real problem. Because it's all too real that we get sick because we're humans, we also need to take holidays because we're human. The summer and the winter holidays shouldn't be a risk on the reg risk register or a Gantt chart that has a thick layer of contingency. And this shouldn't hinder our delivery. So going back to agile teams and what agile teams do is they become cross-functional and self-organizing, just as uh, touched on in the beginning. And one of the most logical and practical ways of getting products to, mar to market sooner, safer, and happier by bringing valuable return on the investment. So it's not Batman versus Superman. It's not, you know, do I go on holiday or do I work night and day? But it is that agile teams, apologies for the sound, agile teams work together differently. And this for me, as a, coming from project management, was a massive revelation. Self-organizing grown adults able to make a plan about what they can achieve together today or in the next 24 hours as teams, they don't need a project manager to tell them what to do or perhaps how to do something was that was my revelation. Remembering earlier again that we touched on the cross-functional teams, everyone is able to pick up anything on the board 
or anything in that in that uh, chosen list of uh, commitments that for the time box. And it's not just this, but it's also cross-functional. So um, you're able to uh, work within the needs of your team and deliver that time box as well. This unblocks a whole heap of wait times and lead times and bottlenecks. Although I have found this both in myself and my experience as coaching organizations now to move into this cross-functional and self-organizing way of working. My tips, if I were to give you one today, is do things like this incrementally. Work it as you would in your product delivery. So perhaps you may want to uh, introduce in your next sprint, let's say you need someone in there and you say, you know what, like we're just gonna have it for this sprint. We're gonna see how that works. Then do a show and tell. Show them the value that you have bought and show them how that sped up bringing the value to their customers because that's the important thing as well. So do as you do in bringing products to the market sooner and gaining continuous feedback on how that worked. Working with your customers and inviting customer collaboration over contract negotiation. And lastly then, optimism over planning. In fact, optimism over unrealistic planning. Don't paint a picture uh, that's unrealistic because it will only build on an unrealistic plan. By saying we just need to get it done or better you just need to get it done doesn't actually again magically make it happen. So if you are told this, challenge it. It may be a little bit scary in the beginning because your boss is telling you or your product owner is telling you, get it done. Or perhaps you're new in the company. Um, perhaps, <laughs> like myself, uh, sometimes I always feel like I'm saying no. Or that you aren't confident in challenging others. But if you give a plan or an estimate based on knowing that the foundations of that plan is we just need to get it done, then as a team, that can only lead to potential failure and you can only blame yourself. And we know that in Agile, blame is not something that we should be, um, be fostering. So as Agile teams, we have to be bold. We have to speak up bring value, bring knowledge, pose what can be done if there is that forced deadline by management or whoever it might be. You know, you might be a bubble agile team amongst a very different environment, but following a plan that is intangible shouldn't, shouldn't be something that, that comes about. It's about responding to change over following a plan, right? Remembering those values. And as a recovering project manager, I always challenge this. And I always had a challenge myself. I needed my Gantt. I needed to follow something. But Agile is about being realistic. A project is born because of building something new. Even if you've built it a million times before, perhaps as an individual project manager or a team, there's always, every project is different. There's always going to be challenges. No project is the same. So respond to change over following a plan. So if you can deliver on time to budget and to the quality whilst having flexibility in the features in order to continuously improve and give our customers what they want. So in summary then, I have learned and I know now that the team has input into the plan. The team agrees the plan. The team estimates with experience. The team should understand their shortfalls as well. 
and the team should be supported to speak up. And lastly, the team are listened to as well. By applying these knowns, you are moving into an agile mindset. As hard, it, as hard as it is from a command and control foundation. Conceptually, it's easy to understand, but as most things, it is hard to implement. And that is all from me. Thank you so much for listening. Um, any questions uh, from the audience or Innes? Any questions come in on the chat? So thank you very much, Helen. Uh, I love the very illustrative talk. <laughs> um, you know, for a reason they say the images uh, speak thousand words. And um, in terms of questions, we don't have any popped in the chat, but if you guys want to go ahead and unmute yourself, go for it. I will ask you something in the meantime. So as a new Scrum Master, so we have many Scrum Masters uh, become a Scrum Master as we speak and over the last few years. So what will be one piece of advice that you'll give them? Um, I think it would be uh, keep it simple. It's one thing um, at Make It and as a person that I always say, keep things simple. You know, coming from your ceremonies that you run, you know, your, your retros, sprint planning, all of that sort of stuff. I say run, I should say facilitate. There's my project management coming out. Um, but yeah, keep, keep it simple. Don't overcomplicate things. That answer your question. Thank you. It's a good <laughs> motto. Um, we have one question. Um, what is the one lesson you wish you had learned in the first years of your career? Um, I, I think I wish that I had been a lot more bold in challenging the status quo of it's always been done like this and therefore we'll continue. It's definitely something um, that I've grown into even the past sort of six, seven years. Um, it doesn't get you in the good books. Um, I won't lie about that. And in fact, I've had some very challenging conversations over it. But I do believe that if you continue to do something the way it's always been, then <laughs> you're walking into a big trap and actually you're not bringing value. So yeah, I, I think that's, yeah. Speak up and challenge. Thank you. We got another one. What are the first steps you would advise a project manager that wants to make the move from a traditional project manager to an agile approach? Hmm. I would say experiment. Um, read some. Uh, read the Agile Manifesto. Read uh, the principles and the values of what Agile is about, and try stuff. Um, well, actually, one key tip would be: whatever you do, do not mention that you're trying out Agile approaches because you will lose the audience. Um, I did that once um, a few years ago, stupidly, and I've actually had someone walk out the room and said, well, I won't do it this way, um, after they were doing it for three months <laughs> because I made that mistake, yeah. Yeah, a good one. Are these guys agile work so much better? Yes, yeah. <laughs> Like, a um, for example, da sorry, just to touch on it, the daily, for example, if you just said, oh, you know, how about we just have a quick catch up? We're going through, you know, a tough moment. Anybody mind 15 minutes in the morning? Nobody thinks twice about it. Um, don't call it stand up. <laughs> Go on. And um, I think extending from the previous uh, question of what would be your top tip for a new Scrum Master on day one of a new job? I'd say um, be confident in your skills because you have been trained up or you're there because you want to make change and you want to bring value. Um, so just be confident um, because 
you're the expert. Um, you are, um, yeah, you're here to make change. And remember that you're a facilitator as well and you're a coach. Um, so you're not there to tell people what to do. You're, te you're there to, um, to enable people to think differently and to enable change. Um, yeah. Me. <laughs> not, not quite. <laughs> um, um, any other questions? So, what mm. training courses would you recommend to become an agile scrum master? Oh, great question. So, I have um, I've done two types. I've done uh, agile eight training course, um, which I actually really enjoyed um, a few years back. But recently, I've done my advanced Scrum Master with uh, Jeff Watts and Paul Goddard. And it's called, uh, the company's called Inspect and Adapt, I think. Um, Innes actually recommended it uh, to me. And it was really fantastic. I would, it's a totally different way of learning. Um, well, it certainly was the virtual way. Um, uh, it's called Inspect and Adapt. Uh, in fact, let me uh, let me just cover it here and inspect and adapt, and that's oh, and uh, Jeff Watts. G off, G off. <laughs> yeah, that's oh. it. That's it. And um, it's hard. So in comparison from uh, five cents from me on the course, it's hard. You're going to need to do some post work. It's not only the course by itself, but it's like the post and the pre and all of that. But it really made me realize that there was so much that I still needed to digest. Um, so really, yeah. OK, any last questions or words of wisdom, Helen? <laughs> I'm all out of words of wisdom now. Um, but, you know, feel free to reach out on LinkedIn or, you know, anything else if you have things throughout. Yeah, it was great. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much. And also, I completely forgot to say that um, you like the co-pilot here and you're helping to organize the meetup. Um, so thank you so much to, you know, volunteer to be the first guinea pig. And, um, <laughs> and um, yeah, and so now it's time. We're like five minutes ahead of schedule for. Um, so I love to introduce, I'm super mega happy to introduce our um, second speaker. It's, uh, yeah, I'm super thrilled to have Vasco Duarte with us. Um, I must admit uh, that the concept of recovering project manager is beyond inspired from, you know, the multiple mentions uh, that ba Vasco does in the Scrum Master Toolbox podcast, which I can put a, a link in the comments. Um, and Vasco and the guest have been, you know, my company of like my morning food for thought when I've been going to clients. Um, for a very long time and it's a fantastic podcast so i would certainly recommend it to everybody and yeah so today we have Vasco that is covering a case study on an agile strategy so yeah Vasco, the the floor is yours and again thank you so much for being with us all right <clears throat> excuse me thank you uh and uh ellen thank you very much for the uh presentation and sharing your story uh that's brilliant so uh, I'm sure I would like to have you on the podcast as well. So you just be in touch when you're ready for it. Because uh, on the podcast, we actually do that. We do what you just did. We talk about people's experiences, what they go through and, and what they learn. So thank you very much for that. And um, just to get people to, to start participating in the chat a little bit more, I have a few questions. So um, if you have heard the podcast, and by the way, the link is now on the, on the chat, uh, please type yes in the chat if you have heard even one episode type yes in the chat ines of course gracias ines <clears throat> pj as well christina no okay that's good christina there's a lot to learn there's 300 hours of audio interviews uh about scrum 
and uh, uh, definitely about a lot about the journey. Uh, we even have a special episode on the journey from project manager to Scrum Master. Uh, it was way back when in the beginning of the podcast. So we got, we got uh, um, I can't remember his name, unfortunately, now. But uh, we got a, a friend from Italy to share his story about how to go from being a project manager to being a Scrum Master. Yeah, so the link, Phyllis, is just uh, slightly above in the chat I'll, I'll i'll post it again uh there you go that's the the link to the podcast uh, all the episodes are all on the website so you can listen to it but you can also subscribe and and listen to it on your phone uh so let, let's get started with um what i have to share with you guys which is basically uh, also a journey uh, a journey by a scrum master who was asked to work with a uh, management team that was adopting Agile in the whole organization. So first of all, this is the link. So you can find the podcast there. Uh, and it's really about one concept I want to you guys to think about. It's Agile strategy. So that's the concept. And it, this is a case study of how to run an Agile business. And the idea here is that it's not a project, it's a business. So it's a case study of about 18 months of adopting portfolio level safe uh, in a leadership team of a multinational company. So, but first, I would like to share uh, a story that is not really the case study, but it's just to get you guys warmed up. Uh, here's two companies, Thomas Cook and Expedia. Who knows Thomas Cook? Could you type yes in the chat? Who knows? Thomas Cook, uh, probably you've used it as well, right? It's it's a very popular uh, vacation and packaged vacation or packaged holiday company. Uh, they also have resorts and so on. Are actually, I should say, they had because Thomas Cook has famously gone bankrupt. Famously gone bankrupt. Uh, when I prepared this presentation, they were not bankrupt yet. As you can see, the presentation was done in 2015 because I have data up to 2014. Uh, but now, nowadays they're bankrupt, right? And funnily enough, the other company on the other side is Expedia. How many of you guys have used Expedia? Okay, a lot of you guys have used Expedia. Um, all right, how about Hotels.com? Who's used Hotels.com? Right, so Hotels.com is Expedia. It, it's just a front for the service they provide and they use uh, or they, they serve hotel reservations through uh, uh, hotels.com. But look at this, Expedia's revenue is this blue bar, which is about half of what Thomas Cook's revenue was. There's a big gap here. This is about half of what R Thomas Cook's revenue was in 2014, right? But how about this? same revenue so half of what thomas cook is and look at the difference in terms of operating profit from 10 percent to six percent now one could say oh come on you're talking about the dying company what does that have to do with agile well it has to do with agile in a couple of ways first let's start with what the consequence of these two numbers is first consequence is this market cap right don't forget that Expedia had, at this time, half the revenues, half the revenues. And if I look at market cap, the blue ball is Expedia. This is Expedia. And this is Thomas Cook. Now, think about this for a second. A company that has half the revenues that Thomas Cook has is valued by the market something like, you know, five to ten times higher than the the much more money generating company which is thomas cook so why does that happen well let's explore that a little bit this is it's not really a true photo but it could be a photo of thomas cook's board or management board because that's how old they are they were formed i think in 1841 so just about the time this photo was taken and that's probably what a board meeting for Thomas Cook would look like. Now, the problem with this is that the world today isn't like it was back then. In fact, uh, this is a map, by the way, 
And this map is mm, maybe 1600, something like that. And you will notice that in this map, there's these weird illustrations here, right? Like this weird fish and monsters. Think about this for a second. This- Hi, Vasco, so sorry. I think, oh, there you go, the map up here. Thank you, sorry. Oh, it's taking that long to appear. Okay, that's good to know. Did you see the board? Because that's a nice picture. The management yes, we board. Did. Yes. Okay. We liked cool. it so much that stay with us extra. <laughs> good, good. All right. So if you see the map now, you will see this weird looking fish. And these are actually monsters. And uh, uh, in the old map trade, we would say, here be monsters. Uh, and that meant that there's something happening here that we don't know. Probably never, no one ever went there, or if they went, they never came back. So we don't know what's there. So we'll just write, we'll, we'll just draw some monsters to tell you, you know, don't go there, right? And you will see that the proportions of the map are all wrong, and you know, the the coast is not very delineated. Uh, it's definitely not proportional. So don't try to measure anything with this map, right? Here's the thing: this map is a lot more accurate than what we have for our business landscape. No matter how ridiculous this map might look, it's a lot more clear than what you know about the business you're in, even than what the managers of your organization know about the business that you're in. All right. And now, did you see the slide change? Just checking. All right. There's some slowness with the slide changing. How about now? That's interesting. All right, that's easy. I'll stop sharing and start sharing again so that you will see the next slide. All right. Do you see the slide that says Innovator's Dilemma? Very good. Perfect. All right. So The Innovator's Dilemma is a book by Clayton Christensen, and he says this brilliant, insightful statement here. The logical, competent decisions of management that are critical to the success of their companies, i.e. they made you successful yesterday, are also the reason why they lose their position of leadership. Now, if you think about the map again, it makes perfect sense because we don't actually know where we are. We don't know where we are navigating. The maps we have for the business planet are a lot less accurate than the maps we had even in the 1500s for the actual physical planet. All right, did the slide change? Just checking. There's something wrong with the slide. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, it, it did, all right. So. As a management team, we need a method to navigate a new territory. And this new territory is also constantly changing because that's the nature of business. It's constantly changing territory. And we need to do that at the portfolio and therefore at the senior management level. Why portfolio? Because portfolio is where you make this long lasting and high impact decisions in a company right to do certain things or not to do certain things it's not about do we, can we execute it's about do we, can we even start planning on them right and now you should see another slide yes all right there's like five seconds delay so here are the problems we must solve first are we on the right path and are we progressing quickly enough by the way, Agile helps a lot with this first question. Not necessarily the path, because that's business question. It's not a project question. But definitely, are we progressing quickly enough? We can know that by just using Agile approaches, like the demo at the end of every sprint. It tells you whether you are progressing. Then with so many options, meaning you know, there's all kinds of ideas of what we could be doing, how do we choose the right ones and how do we focus a whole organization? How do you focus the whole organization in implementing the right initiatives, right? And again, Agile presents a lot of solutions here. And then finally, the uh, Winston Churchill rule, no matter how beautiful the strategy, 
we must occasionally look at the results. And of course, by occasionally, we mean always look at the results. Uh, so whatever we need to put in place, and, and again, Agile is brilliant for this, we don't just say, here's what we want to do. We check, is it working as we expect, right? And that's something that Helen already mentioned in, in her presentation. Project managers that switch to Agile immediately start doing what project managers that are not yet in Agile will do once a week. They do it every day, right? It's a very simple tool that we use, at least in Scrum, the stand-up. The stand-up is a 15-minute session to make sure we still know where we're going and we are progressing. And in the old school project management, you would do that in a status meeting, which of course would be all kinds of fake greens, uh, watermelon projects, right? Like green on the outside, red on the inside. And we would do that once a week. It's like, if you have a problem on Monday, you don't wait for Friday to talk about it, right? So here's one example of how Agile has changed the game for us. Okay, here's what's not going to work. And you will see a picture show up in the next slide. All right, don't start the culture transformation and hope that people change the way they work. This is the biggest anti-pattern in agile adoptions that I see. Oh, it, you know, you need to change the culture. Well, yeah, maybe you need to change the culture, but if you start a culture change, you're not going to change the way people work. So we should be focusing on concrete things, on things like uh, agreeing on very simple methods of tracking progress, like daily stand-ups and demos, right? So what I'm actually talking about is, uh, I have to go to this one, all right. You see uh, tools over frameworks? Yeah, so that's where we need to go. So many of you will be familiar with frameworks like SAFE and some others. So here's how you implement SAFE. You don't implement SAFE or, or like Helen said, don't start implementing Agile by talking about implementing Agile, right? We need to pick the right tools. We need to put the right tools in practice and the tools will have an impact. Now, the impact might not be what you expect, but they will always have an impact. And that's what Agile is about. And of course, although we know that there's value of the, uh, on the items on the right, the frameworks, we value the items on the left more, the tools. Because real change, and in this case, we're talking about leadership change on how they manage an entire organization only happens through action. It doesn't not happen through plans or, you know, projects. It happens through action. It happens through the things they do differently every day. Uh, you should see tool number one right now, right? So tool number one is the business model canvas. So here's the leadership team working on a canvas to explain their strategy to each other first and then to the rest of the organization, right? Now, these days, if you ask me, I would not use business model canvas, I would use the lean canvas, but it's basically the same, right? In fact, the picture you see here is the lean canvas. It's not the business model canvas. Who's ever used the lean canvas before? Could you type yes on the chat? All right, some of you have, that's perfect. Uh, so Nishila has a question, what do you mean by tools? So this is tool number one. We're actually going to go through 10 tools that help you to implement agile thinking and agile execution at the portfolio level. So this is not team you know, doing the work level, this is portfolio level. This is about deciding what projects do we even fund or start. Right, that's what we're talking about. So the tools we're talking about are about that level. All right, tool number two. You see tool number two now? Yeah, there we go. So tool number two, uh, something that is quite obvious, but very often ignored, a defined and quantified strategic goal. Here's the thing that happens. People talk about strategies and then they forget 
how do we know we're there? Well, if you can't quantify a strategic goal, you don't know if you're there. If you don't know if you're there or even how close you are, you can't assess how fast you're progressing. Right? And also you can't assess how you're progressing at all. It's like it's like trying to go somewhere which you don't know where it is through a road you've never traveled before with the car that random randomly changes velocity. Okay, that's not going to work, right? So goals defined and quantified become a tool for us to help the team, in this case, a leadership team, create a sense of progress. Without that, there is no sense of progress. We can't progress if there's no benchmark, right? Uh, here's the, the, the example they came up. This was a, a South American company. And they said, by the end of 2017, implement cloud solution with seven clients in Mexico. It's quite well defined. It doesn't say what the cloud solution is, but it does say you need to have seven clients and it does say it's in Mexico, right? So a cloud solution, maybe you already have it. Perfect, just get the seven clients or maybe you don't have it. Okay, great. So figure out what's the minimum we can do to get those seven clients. And this changes the conversation. It's no longer about getting all the features we want into the release that has a deadline and everything has a deadline, but it's rather getting seven clients to pay for it. It changes the conversation from scope management to business impact. This is how goals can change the conversation. And now tool number three, do you see tool number three? All right, there we go. Impact map, and this is a tool, by the way, by Goiko Adzic, so you can search for it. I think it's probably on impactmap.com as well, to discover the high impact work. And, and I want to highlight this idea of high impact. We all know, we intuitively and sometimes even painfully know that the work we're doing has no impact. But we're doing it because it's in the what Ellen would call in her old days, the project plan. Guess what? It doesn't matter because what matters is the impact you create. So here's a tool, Impact Map, to create the conversation, in this case with the leadership team, about what brings impact. And Ines put the, the link on the chat. That's great. Uh, Nishila is saying that the screen is blurry. It might be. I think it's uh, basically the text within the boxes, but I believe it's intentional. Yeah, I don't know. Oh, yeah, this true. This is true. Yeah, this this here should be blurry because this is pri proprietary information that cannot be disclosed. All right, cool. So what we do, we have a goal and we have a measure, which we defined with tool number two. And now we ask, who can help us achieve that? So in that case, who can help us reach seven clients in Mexico? What are the impacts? So for example, get meetings with the clients or uh, validate the list of functionality that they need to go live or whatever that might be. And then the deliverables, which is the actual work, right? Deliverables are the actual work is what would end up on a backlog or a project plan. So now we know that in order to achieve this goal, we need to work with these actors on these impacts by doing this work. And this is just a conversation to discover the high impact work, right? Uh, uh, Helen, in her presentation, talked about uncertainty and how we should be, you know, optimist. So here's the thing. When you have a goal, you can be optimist. You can work towards the goal, validate the impact of the work that you've done, and then adapt, then change direction. When you have a project plan, you cannot be an optimist. In fact, all project managers know, and I'm sure Ellen will smile when I say this, all project managers learn to be pessimistic by trade. We need to be pessimistic to be successful project managers. Why? Because when you have a plan, the only thing that could happen is things go wrong. When you have a goal, 
things can still go wrong, but now you've opened up the possibility for things to go right. And that's what the impact map is all about, is to discover what makes us get the impact that we want. That's tool number three. And now we're going to talk about tool number four. And there's going to be an Airbnb graph showing up. You see this curve here? This curve represents 800% growth. Now, there's a question for you guys related to this graph. How many would be laughed out of the room if they came to work and presented a business case for a project with 800% impact or return? So type yes if you think you would be laughed out of the room with an 800% business case projection. Yeah, Ellen would be fired. Yeah. You could say you're an optimist at least because that's coherent. <laughs> for insanity, definitely. Right. So here's the thing. For Airbnb, this was not insanity. They did not get laughed out of the room. They actually did it. They made it happen. How did they make it happen? They made it happen because they discovered what worked. How did they discover? There's an interesting story. They went to New York to talk to hosts, people who have apartments and you know could put the apartments on the Airbnb platform. They talked to them face to face, one by one, knocking on doors. And some people said, yes, you can put my apartment there. And some said, no. But the ones that said yes, they took pictures. And, and the founders, one of the Airbnb founders, was an amateur photographer. So he had good gear with him. He took pictures, and the pictures looked good. And they went back to San Francisco, put it up on the web. And guess what? The uh, properties, the apartments that had the professionally taken pictures had a 30% higher booking rate. 3-0, 30% higher. All right, I want you guys to get your chats ready. How, how many of you have seen 30% growth happen from one day to the other? 30% growth, 30% growth happening from one day to the other. Yes, no, never, Christos, never, yes. Not yet, that's a very good answer in this. That's the answer that gets you ready to see it in the future. Salesforce shares. Yeah, but that shares, that's not business. Forget about it, right? It, um, we're talking about business, like real business with products and services and stuff like that. The problem is, indeed, that 30% growth is rare, but they found it. Now, here's the thing. They found it because they did not use long-term planning. They found it through experimentation, through exposing their product to the market, through listening to what was happening, and then quickly reacting to take advantage of what they discovered. So tool number four for leadership teams and portfolio management is rethink the role of long-term planning. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't do long-term planning. I'm saying it's not enough. And hopefully, if you believe what I'm saying, you will understand that not only is it not enough, but it actually is a constraint. It prevents you from finding 800% growth, uh, if nothing else, because if you would put that into your long-term plan, you would be laughed out of the room, right? Oh, I got this perfect plan. It's going to give us 800% growth. People would start laughing at you, right? So rethink the role of long-term planning. Here's some other crazy Airbnb milestones, you're probably going to see that now. And that that's uh, winter 2012, Airbnb overtakes Hilton in Nights Booked. Airbnb, Hilton. You know, Airbnb has no properties. Hilton is probably one of the uh, largest uh, uh, hotel chains. I don't know if they are still or wherever. In 2014, they received investment that valued them at 10 billion US, 10 billion, 10 billion. That's, that's a pretty big number. All right. 
So here's the message behind this tool number four. When business speeds up, the planning cycle should also speed up. <clears throat> so the, the key insight here is you can't just use the same old traditional long-term planning at the portfolio level. You need to speed that up. It needs to be quicker. <clears throat> so uh, now you're going to see a Kanban board. Here's how this whole portfolio was managed. So on the left, we had the strategic categories, the new opportunities and the strategic capabilities. For example, bringing in a new CRM, whatever that might be. So stuff that helps us implement our strategy was here. And this is new business opportunities. And then we have what we call value streams in safe, but basically we were working on, you know, product one here, product two here, capability A here, and capability B here as an example. This is just an example. And then we break that down into epics, and then the teams will break that down into features and stories. And eventually we will get to the market. Uh, there's two directions in, in this Kanban board. The first direction is, of course, in this direction. That's execution. And then there's the reverse direction. And that's learning, right? Don't forget. It's very easy to forget because if we look at it with a sequential mindset, we forget the feedback loop that is inbuilt into this uh, uh, board, which is the learning cycle, right? Once we put something out, we see how it works and that influences stories or influences features or influences epics. And it might be going all the way to strategy. I was having a session with this team, this team of leaders, and somebody mentioned an initiative that everybody said, yeah, that makes sense. And then somebody said, but wait, that does not fit any of our strategic themes. And they went like, huh, that's weird. It should. All right, now you can change strategy, right? Listen to what's going on and then react to it. So they were discussing an epic and they said, okay, that epic makes sense, but it does not fit any of the strategic themes. All right, change the strategic themes. That's what they did. So there's three aspects to this board. First is of course, visibility and governance. And the governance here, it's not project management governance. Project management governance is achieved through reporting, so checking reports. In agile portfolio management or agile strategy, the governance is achieved through validated learning or validated hypotheses in the market through actual product releases, things we put out in the market. We see how people see them, we learn, and then we build that learning into the earlier steps of the portfolio. That's what governance is all about. And then two, speed. Uh, and of course, speed, there's no magic here. I'll explain that in a second. Uh, and business focus. The first, the business focus. Business focus is important because, of course, you want to get the whole organization to put push in the same direction. And you do that by having it all visible. So every story is linked to a feature. Every feature is linked to an epic. Every epic is in a value stream. And of course, every value stream belongs to a new opportunity or a strategic capability. So there's complete linkage. And then finally, what is happening here is that we are enabling decisions at all levels. Once we have this breakdown, once we have the, you know, we have teams here, we have product owners here, we have leadership team here. Uh, they are all making the decisions at their level. So teams can decide to implement certain stories because they fit a certain feature. Uh, product managers can decide to implement certain features because they, in, they fit a certain epic and so on. So we're delegating decisions to the right level of the organization. Here's how this uh, work in practice. You will see a slide that says uh, cycles of control. This slide is about how this whole fit together. So we had a strategy cycle, which was six months that was implemented through a portfolio cycle, which happened twice in six months. So it was three months. And then we had 
two week concept cycles and two week market delivery cycles. And <clears throat> again, this has two directions, strategy implementation and market learning, right? At strategy level, we decide where to invest. And then at portfolio level, we translate that into a list of initiatives. Concept twin uh, is about making those initiatives more clear what they are about, and then the team delivers this. All of these cycles, the cool thing about these cycles is that they all feed each other. They're all linked. It's not in projects, we have a problem, which is somebody decides a project, the project gets started, and then the project exists in a vacuum. Well, not literally, but conceptually in a vacuum. It has funding, it has you know people assigned to it and so on, and then it just goes. So what we're doing here is that we're linking even every two weeks, we're linking everything up the chain for decision making. And that's completely different than what the project mindset or a project framework would be about. And now we should see tool five. Tool five is how this looked in practice. We have here the decision making tool. That's our funnel. Then we have the epics in review analysis, the stuff that is in the backlog, in progress and done. But now think about this. This is the actual picture of the board. And you see that above this line, we have strategically aligned epics. Below this line, we have maintenance or legacy epics, stuff that does not implement the strategy. So a question for you to put on the chat, on a scale from one to 10, 10 being the best and one being the worst, how good is this company at implementing their own stated strategy? So what you see on the board is the amount of work that is ongoing. Above the line, you see the strategically aligned work. And below the line, you see the work that is just there. It's not strategically aligned. It's just previous commitments. All right, Ellen changed from four to two after the explanation. That's good. <clears throat> Here's the thing that happened. When they saw this, they themselves realized that they were not very good at implementing their own strategy. And the reason for that is very simple. In the in progress column, this is actually being worked on. You have maybe half of an epic that is strategically aligned, and you have all of these that are not strategically aligned. So you're already visualizing how bad you are at implementing strategy. Now, it may still be required to do all of those things. The, the, the board does not tell you that you, you can stop those things. What the board tells you is that you have set up the system for failure. Now it's up to you to change the system, but the system is set up for failure because there's no work being done on the strategic direction of the organization. That's tool number five. All right, and now you should see tool number six. Right, so tool number six is prioritization. Prioritize everything according to your strategy. Here's how they did, uh, they did it. They had a typical four quadrant matrix, so like really easy. Then they had on the uh, 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 y-axis, they had time to market, where higher means faster. And then on the x-axis, they uh, had impact on strategic goal, where on the right, you have the highest impact items. All right, and if this is a simple thing. You just pick one from here, forget the others, right? Because this is the fastest to market and the highest strategic uh, impact. So this is the item by default that you should take. Maybe you take this, maybe you take this, <clears throat> but this is the most obvious choice, right? 
And we did this very simple conversation, just, you know, relative uh, in these two categories, just relative uh, classification, and then we just chose one, right? But everything is prioritized. And because the prioritization is so quick, it's visual and it's quick, you don't need to worry about prioritizing. Everything is prioritized. <clears throat> then we have tool seven. And tool seven is about experiments. Every deliverable is tested for market fitness. Now this board is not from that particular company. This is from my company. And this board was quite early in our development. We had seven ongoing experiments, 20 completed, 15 strategic and technical in, tactical insights and two market experiments a month was our average. Uh, we now have something like 380 experiments already run. We have a database of insights that we can search and find, you know, if we want to do something, what have we learned in the past? But that's something we, we have these days. We didn't have at that point. But you see the, the, the knowledge base is here. So this is what we've learned. This is the experiments that we've run and got what we expected and the ones that we didn't get what we expected. That's pretty much what an experiment board looks like. And what this means for this particular organization is that we test everything in the market. We try everything. We see the impact of everything. That's what it meant for the way they were working. And then there was tool number eight. There's only two more to go. Tool number eight is about having a breakdown of items that facilitates conversation, right? So epics are discussed at the product and mark, product marketing and portfolio level, features at product owner, architect, UX level, and user stories team and product owner level. If we want to look at it from the old school project management perspective, Epics are portfolio items and features are longer term planning. So something like, you know, two, three iterations, something like that. And then finally, we have where rubber, rubber sorry, meets the road. Those are the user stories. Uh, the cool thing about this is that you don't need to have all the user stories to get started. It's enough if you have all the epics because that's what you decide on. That's what you make implementation decisions on. But it also allows the team to bring their thinking into what we are doing, to bring their technical innovation. Because the user stories are the actual solution definition, while features and epics are more like problem definition. Therefore, we allow the teams to come in and innovate, to bring their perspective, their technical insight on how to improve the business. Tool number nine is retrospectives. Uh, um, for those of you that have heard the podcast before, you know retrospectives are one of the focus items for us every week. And there's a good reason for that. In fact, uh, some of you might have heard that there's only two tools that I take for every client assignment that I have. Only two. And those are first, visualize all the work. And I mean all the work. And second, retrospectives. If you have these two, if you have visualization and retrospectives, if you just start with these two, you can't avoid ending up with Agile. It will get there. It might take some time, but you will get there. Why? Because teams are getting better. And not only that, but they're making deliberate decisions on what they work on because they're visualizing it. As I usually say, if you can't see it, you can't manage it. And if you do that, if you know what you're working on and you make deliberate decisions and you're constantly improving how you work, sooner or later, you will have short iterations, market feedback, more collaboration among the team members, probably daily stand-ups and so on and so forth. And finally, tool number 10. <clears throat> and tool number 10 is actually kind of tool number nine, but turned all the way up to 11. And that is, manage the portfolio through facilitated conversations. And especially these days when we're all online, I mean, who is tired of online meetings? Type yes in the chat. 
You wake up in the morning and you go like, hmm, I'm so happy I have five hours of online meetings today. Oh my God. So here's the thing. Even online meetings can be productive and fulfilling if they are around facilitated conversations. Here you see the guys, right? The guys, this is the, the leadership team. They were going into it. They were really investing their own thinking, their time, their energy into this conversation. And the reason why this conversation happened was, and you can see there, they visualized their strategy. There's a visualization board here. Here's, they created a three-dimensional cube to explain what they were trying to achieve. Like this is, this is stuff, it doesn't come if you're sitting down and looking at the PowerPoint, like you are right now, by the way. So this is just the trigger. You still have a lot of thinking to do when you get out of here, right? But this engages stakeholders. It allows for collaboration to emerge in ways you can't predict. So don't try to plan it. It's not going to work as you expect it. It's probably going to work a lot better if you are able to facilitate that conversation. And for me, this is the kicker quick decision making. Some of the things that they decided in this conversation right here, this, these things would normally take months of meetings to decide, like literally months of meetings, right? Because they, they decided on portfolio, geography, and customer segment with that uh, three-dimensional cube there. And they did that in less than a day, right? That's part of the work they were doing on, on agile portfolio management. So really, at the end of the day, the questions we should ask ourselves are, are we learning fast enough? That's what agile strategy and agile portfolio management is all about. It's about enabling a faster speed of learning, learning, right? And then are we adapting fast enough? Because it's not enough to learn, you need to adapt, right? Uh, uh, Deming, a guy that I read a lot, used to say this very, very insightful phrase. He says, changing is not mandatory, or you don't need to change. Survival is not mandatory, right? And the goal here is that learning is not about learning. Learning is about preparing the change. It's about feeding the change. It's about boosting the change. That's what learning is there for, right? So we need to ask these two questions. Are we learning fast enough? And are we changing? Are we adapting fast enough? That's why I then changed the name of the cycles of control into cycles of learning. You know, it's coherent, at least. That's my perspective. All right, and just before the questions, uh, this one. Yeah, this is William Moss. That's the CEO of the company that uh, this story is about. And, and that's his comment about what we did there. For me, the most important thing is this whole Agile portfolio management and Agile strategy, it was not introduced as Agile. It was introduced as let's get the portfolio level working, please, right? But that let the whole organization start working Agile. Because once the portfolio is Agile, you can't have long-term projects that are pre-planned in advance. No, you have to start building the agile cycle also in the team level. It's unavoidable because the decision-making defines the tact time or the cycle time at the execution level, right? If you have strategy cycles of three years or one year, teams can go out and spend 11 months on the beach and then come back in the last month to make sure that some progress is there and everything is still red, like it usually is at the end of the period. But if you need to deliver something to the market every, every month or every two weeks, then we need to start focusing on how to enable the teams to get there. And that drives agility. You don't need to convince anyone. You don't need to talk about agility if the CEOs are speaking the language, right? If the leadership teams are speaking the language. So that's my spiel. Are you learning fast enough? And are you adapting fast enough? I gave you 10 tools for that. Uh, so hopefully you'll start using some of those, uh, but now opening up for questions.
I thank you so much, Vasco. I just wanted to, to thank. Uh, it's fantastic. I think it's a recording I'm going to rewatch uh, more than a few times and, and refer back to. So thank you to share those tools with us. Um, yeah, so in the chat, we don't have any questions right now, but Helen, please go ahead. I was going to ask, um, how do you guide uh, the team in visualizing the work in progress? I often or have come across, I should say, but it was too small to put on the board. And I sort of respond, well, if you have a number of small things, it's gonna start building up and probably worth representing. How do you, how would you advise dealing with those sorts of situations? Yeah, so that there's a, a trick I learned over the time. Um, you probably see now on my screen share, you see the tool number five again, right? All right. So tool number five is a portfolio board. And you see those small items there, pieces of paper, those are all big epics actually. Even though they're small, they're big epic. And uh, what I discovered is that the work isn't visualized because you want to visualize it. Visualization is something you grow over time. So start with the board, whatever the board is. And the trick that I've used in, in some of the organizations where I worked is that every time something is talked about in a daily uh, stand-up, we ask which epic or feature is this about? And e either it exists, either there's an epic or a feature that exists, or there isn't one. And if there isn't one, we create one. And what you will see is that the list of epics in progress will start to grow. The number of things in this column will start to grow to the point, and uh, I don't have a slide here, but uh, uh, I, I've shown this in other forums, to the point where at some point you discover that you have so much work in progress, and this actually happened to me, that you have about 18 months of work to complete in the month and a half that you have left in the quarter, right? So I, I was talking to a manager, we did this visualization trick. The team started pulling up stuff and the epic started showing up on the board. At the end of about three months, we had 140 items on the board. Uh, they were delivering something like 30 items per quarter. Uh, and and uh, I asked, so um, what do you think is going on? And uh, Yuha was his name. He, he leaned back, he shook his head and he said, I'm in pain. They discovered, they discovered they had about five years worth of work in their backlog of epics, five years. And this was just before a new strategy was introduced. So they knew a lot more was coming, right? So one trick on visualization is never expect it to be done when you visualize it first. You have to keep on it and over time, the visualization will gain a more clear depiction of reality. It will become a more, uh, a higher fidelity representation of what's going on in the organization. And at that time, you can start to make decisions. So Phyllis talks about one of the reasons Thomas Cook failed was a, a political Brexit. Well, Brexit was not even on the cards in 2014 and they were already threatening bankruptcy way back when. Uh, and of course, they, they can talk about Brexit, and I'm sure that the companies that will go now bankrupt will talk about COVID, and that's okay. It doesn't really matter what those companies talk about. What matters is what we, the outsiders, learn from their stories. And in the case of Thomas Cook, it's pretty clear. You can't compete with in this case, Expedia, uh, competitors that are faster to adapt, faster to learn, and of course, listening to the customers, if you adapt fast, you will eventually provide a service that your customers want. Thomas Cook was married to a already decaying business model. They, they couldn't get out of it, or maybe they could, they just didn't do it.
All right, we have two minutes left. So unless any other, any other questions, what I would like to is uh, thank again our speakers for today. Uh, it's been fantastic. I think it's gonna be a wonderful resource to have for people to refer back. And I, having in mind that, um, let me see, share my screen just quickly, that we definitely want to learn about this initiative and we want to adapt and to make it better. I'm just gonna pop it in the chat. If you would be so kind, and just to share your thoughts, you know, what are the things that has worked well in the meetup? What are the things that could be better? Any other thoughts, you know, we are here to, to have this journey together. So thank you once again. The recording will be up within the next uh, few hours. We'll send um, an updated message into the meetup. And yeah, thank you ever so much once again. I look forward to organizing the next one. Thank you, everybody. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks, Vasco. Thanks, Ernest.